Okay, good morning, welcome. Thank you for being uh, here at our training series today. My name is Gina Castro Rodriguez. I'm the Chief of Victim Services Division for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. I'm a clinical psychologist. And in addition to my work at the District Attorney's Office, I have a small private practice here in San Francisco. And I also teach at the University of San Francisco. The training that we're doing today on pathways to delinquency is one that's really um, close to my heart. It's been the work I have been passionate about for the last 25 years, looking at the relationship between trauma in childhood and risk-taking and delinquent behavior in adolescent and young adult girls. I founded an organization in 2003, co-founded the organization called then the Girls Justice Initiative. It evolved over the years to become the Youth Justice Initiative, where we provided gender responsive mental health, mentoring, and court advocacy services to young people throughout the Bay Area and ultimately across California um, when they were sentenced to detention in California DJJ, uh, Department of Juvenile Justice Systems. I also did my dissertation for my doctorate on the connection between sexual trauma and delinquency and risk-taking behavior for African-American and Latina girls. Uh, so I've, done, I've been researching and practicing around this issue for many years. And it's one of the, the areas that I feel very strongly about informing people about because there's so much we can do to change the trajectory for young women and girls and those who identify as female, yet we don't do a very good job at this. So I thank you all for being here. I hope that this information will help inform the work that you do and that you will take away some um, information that will help you day to day in your service. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Lisa, do you mind putting up the uh, PowerPoint? Thank you. Still responding to people trying to get in. So give me one second. Sorry, I always feel bad when people can't get in, but um, I probably shouldn't be doing this. Okay. All right. So the title is Pathways to Risk-Taking and Delinquency for Girls and Young Women. If you were at the training that we did last month on adolescent and young development, it, uh, adolescent development and young adults, you'll notice that a lot of things that are happening for the young people I'm gonna talk about are normal parts of their development. The problem comes when there is unaddressed trauma, trauma in childhood, and when we don't intervene and help young people get to a safe place and out of risk of harm, okay? Next slide. So today we're gonna to cover gendered violence, abuse, reactions to trauma, the juvenile justice and criminal justice system responses, LGBTQ youth, and then pathways out of delinquency for girls and young women. Next slide. So I'd like to start with the big picture. And the big picture is that, you know, for a very long time, we have allowed violence against women, um, comments against women, uh, gendered, uh, you know, negative comments to be part of our normal everyday life. And a few years ago, when we had the U2 movement, people really started to look at what was being said. Can you please mute? Thank you. Uh, we started to look at, at these things that were being said and how they affected people, but they have a big context for how we see things in the world. Over the pandemic, we have watched some old movies. And when I say old movies, they're not that old in the 80s or the 90s. And it's really amazing to see what was acceptable in the 80s or 90s to say about women, the, the situations that women were put in, the innuendos, the not so innuendo, the more explicit ways that we talked about women and what's acceptable now. Those things permeate our world and then they feed the information that we have about what's okay and what's not. So maybe it starts with a sexist, homophobic, or transgender joke, 
um, with some problematic language and we laugh it off or we get uncomfortable or we're not sure how to deal with that. Very common in the movies that I cited from the 80s and 90s to hear words that we don't use any longer, to hear people referred to in ways that we wouldn't do anymore. But those were common during that time. There's also traditional gender roles that we have in our society. And those roles, even when we're not explicitly uh, framing them and holding people to them, they exist out in the world. They exist in our media. This morning, I saw a picture that Sports Illustrated put of the greatest athletes of all times, and all the people in the picture were male. And someone had to call out that there were no female athletes in that picture. And so that's a very um, implicit way of naming who are the greatest athletes without calling out gender or explicitly saying something, but just giving a picture. I remember when my daughter was little, we bought her one of those little basketball courts that you put out in the yard. It's only about four feet tall and she was a toddler and she could learn to play basketball. And she said, is this for me? And I said, yes, we just bought this for you. And she said, but there's only two boys on the front of it. So the, even just the messaging in our marketing is, gives, us, gives us the idea of who things are meant for and who they're not meant for. At the next level, we get to harassment, threats, and verbal abuse. And, you know, these are things that people say that have been condoned to say, uh, you know, don't don't cry like a girl. Are you going to run like a girl? Uh, don't be don't be such a sissy about that. Things that people say that are meant to demean women and that have become part of our vocabulary and part of the way we think about things. And we don't think about what we really are saying there. It could even be just, you know, the way that we decide what, you know, how we want to speak about women or men and how we do that differently, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, you know, if I get passionate in a meeting or I speak up, am I seen as being pushy? Am I seen as being, um, you know, too aggressive? Am I supposed to wait for the other, you know, males in the room to speak? Those things still happen today. And those things feed into the violence that we start to see for women. So rape and sexual assault and uh, you know severe sexual harassment and physical abuse, even financial abuse, those things feed into the escalated violence. They're not, they're not causation of it because those things don't directly cause them, but they feed that environment where we dehumanize or we lessen a gender because of the way um, we're, we speak about them or think about them in the world. And then ultimately, unfortunately, it leads to the death of some people, you know, whether that's through domestic violence or whether that's through sexual assault or whether that's through harassment and, and murder of LGBTQ people. These, this, this way of thinking really feeds that fury and frenzy. Next slide. I'm going to talk about ACEs, so I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with it, so I but just a little bit of an overview. <clears throat> so ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. About 25 years ago, Kaiser did a study, Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser did a study because he was working with people who had chronic health issues associated with obesity and weight. And what he started to find anecdotally is that People who had these longer term health issues, these more chronic health issues and obesity were anecdotally reporting to him that they had had really terrible things happen in their childhood. And so his hypothesis was that if people had trauma in their childhood, that they would have um, health problems and emotional problems and behavior problems later in life. So he teamed up with the CD and did this big study of 7,000 people accessing health services. At now these were mostly white, mostly educated, all had health insurance through Kaiser and were accessing healthcare. So that's already kind of a skewed group, right? That's, that's uh, people that have the capacity and the privilege to engage in health services and to have insurance and, and, and likely working and have some kind of income. Even with that skewed group, what he found were really big numbers of these 
ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And those are under the abuse category, we have physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. We have neglect, physical and emotional neglect, and then dysfunction in the household. So things like mental illness of a parent or an adult in the house, an incarcerated relative, um, a mother who's treated violently, uh, like an intimate partner violence or, or degraded or, or not, you know, not respected in the house, substance abuse by a parent or a caregiver, and divorce, and not just any divorce, but a, a divorce that was contentious, a divorce that caused the lives of children to change or the lives of the family to change drastically. Next slide. So the problem with the ACEs is that what he found is that the more ACEs you had, the more chronic health issues you had later in life. And not just one-to-one -one ratio, but the, the more ACEs you had, the more intense the health issues were later on in life. So it was actually a dosage issue. If you had one ACE, you had a certain level of health issue there in life. If you had four ACEs, you could have a whole slate of, of issues that related to your physical health, your mental health, and your behavioral health. So things like, um, you know, for physical health, it was things like lung disease and heart disease and cancer and autoimmune deficiencies and um, pulmonary disease. And for mental health, it was things like suicidality and depression and anxiety, uh, substance abuse issues. And for behavioral, he saw a spike in uh, risk, uh, I'm sorry, in self-harm and um, attempted suicide and even smoking, drinking, using drugs. ACEs is the adverse childhood experiences. And so those adverse childhood experiences actually laid the foundation for implications much further along in life for people. And one of the reasons that study was so important is that it tied the issue of trauma to a public health issue. It, it told us that trauma is not just about what happens at the time of the event. It has implications you know, for chronic health issues in the future. And the really important thing about that is that if we do something about the trauma, we can actually prevent those long-term issues. All right, so with girls who are involved in the juvenile justice system, we find that report abuse and to have four or more of those. So four events about earlier, um, girls ha would have those higher doses, which means that they're gonna have a higher impact as they get older. So the emotional system, she's with disorders, uh, related to social, and difficulty identifying and explaining. You know, really later, the inner protect. Gina, I think it's your Wi Fi or if it's, it may be mine, but you seem, you're cutting out. We're unable to hear you. Okay. I don't know what to do about that. My Wi-Fi says it's fully on. Okay. I'm for it. Maybe try turning off your video. Okay, so is that better? Yes. All right, let's start the slide over then. So girls are two times as likely to report four or more ACEs than uh, it, the girls that are involved in the delinquency, delinquency system versus girls that are not involved in the delinquency system. That's really important because that girls that are involved in the delinquency system have even more experiences with trauma than the average girl who's not in the delinquency system. Some of the issues that we see for girls in the delinquency system are emotional issues, irritability, depression, dissociation, 
eating disorders, relationship dysfunction, social phobia, uh, even difficulty identifying and expressing their own feelings, an inability to predict risk and defend themselves. Um, and that's going to really come into play when we start talking about how trauma affects someone long term. The ability to protect and defend is important for our mechanism. But when a young person can't take care of themselves and keep themselves safe, their behaviors start to push other people away to decrease the risk of continued victimization. Under physical abuse, we see aggression, we see anger, we see reenactment of violence, we see replication of intimate partner violence in their relationships, we see sex sometimes and criminal behavior. Lisa, do you want me to come back in? Sure, what to texts and emails that I'm cutting out. You're on mute. Yes, why don't you try exiting and coming back in? Because turning off your video, it's still cutting in and out. Apologize for our technical delay. It's so common with Zoom. We have no control with the Wi-Fi. So really appreciate your patience. Meanwhile, I have also, um, if you look in the chat, I have included um, the SFDA's website and also the link for our future training series, in addition to Gina's bio. Um, so please feel free to um, look into that. I know it is, I'm really, unfortunately, depending on our technology, with Zoom, that is, and it hasn't happened in our previous training, so really apologize. So we do have a suggestion, if it does continue, for our participants to turn off their videos as well, and that may be helpful. Um, I'm admitting I'm Gina in now. Um, and let's see, if it doesn't work for Gina this time, then um, I will ask everyone to turn. She's having a hard time even joining in. Gina, are you with us? Huh. Give us a few seconds, apologize. Lisa, can you hear There's, me now? We can hear you now, Gina. Um, if it continues to go in and out, we have a suggestion um, to ask everyone to turn off their videos. That may um, be causing the, um, the problem with, with the Wi-Fi. So why don't we go ahead and begin? And if you continue to cut in and out, I will ask um, everyone to turn off their videos in hopes that okay. that helps. Okay, and if I continue to if I continue to have problems, we could pause and see if Jamie could start, and then I can move to another location or something. I'm not sure if it's mine. Mine is showing that it's working. Okay. And for those of you asking about the slides, yes, we provide the slides after the training. Um, we also make a video available on our website in about a month, and we do provide certificates for completing the training, but we do not have CEUs. Okay, try one more time. All right, so we're talking about emotional, physical. So Gina, you, you are cutting out. And I'll see what I can do. Okay, should we go ahead and start with Lindsay? Jamie, you go to Jamie? Yes, sorry, Jamie. That's my interpreter. Um, yes, why don't we <clears throat> why don't we do that? Apologize, everyone. This is the first that this has happened to us. So um, we are in this virtual world. So um, 
it will just be a sec. I think we're going to go ahead and um, go ahead with Jamie. One second, please. If we could, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jamie to you. And Jamie, I, I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Salas. And um, Jamie. Um, hi there. Can everybody hear me? I'm just confirming that my mic, mic works. Yes, and we can hear you. Awesome. So welcome, Jamie. And um, I'd like to introduce you to everyone here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone, and thank you for Gina and Victim Services Unit for the invitation. So it's great connecting. And also, if for any reason my wireless is, is a little funky um, these days, it, it happens a lot uh, more times than not. I apologize. And we can begin with your PowerPoint, Jamie. Here sure, we go. Sure. Um, so this is, this is bridging off of Gina's PowerPoint. And so when we go back to Gina's presentation, um, some of the topics that I will address in my presentation, uh, there'll be a different type of connection. So, um, you know, it's just bridging off of, uh, the topic she was going to present and the information she's going to be sharing. So, um, I, I myself am a licensed in marriage and family therapist, um, Jamie Salas, I work at UCSF at San Francisco General um, through the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Services, Division of Infant, Child, and Adolescent Psychiatry in the Juvenile Justice Behavioral Health Team in a gender responsive program called Voices Heal. I know, mouthful. <laughs> um, these days it's, it's uh, more virtual um, than not, though, you know, with the ways things are going, a lot of things can shift. Um, Though the focus of my presentation really is discussing um, steps or approaches that we could all take in in terms of supporting girls and young women in the juvenile justice system towards their own path for healing. So next slide. So today I'm going to briefly touch base on barriers to mental health services. Some of these things um, Gina will also be discussing in presentation or mentioning throughout these presentations. Um, increasing access, what that looks like, and talk about an aspect of gender responsive programming. Next slide. So when we think of mental health needs for girls and women in the justice system, you know, um, I wanna contextualize these, these elements and these pieces of the needs. More than 70% uh, meet criteria for a mental health disorder and around 50% for a substance use disorder. And what we're looking at is more than 90% having experienced at least one trauma or um, one or more in the ACEs categories. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So when thinking about these are large percentages of, of folks, mental health needs, you know, we also take into consideration the barriers or the challenges in accessing supports and services. And some of these things um, could be perceived on behalf of the person. Um, these challenges and barriers are also external and also can be as part of the system, right? systems of care, uh, justice, mental health system, medical care system. And so one of the things to think about is um, just in terms of the person's awareness of maybe denial or minimizing that, you know, what they're going through, they could benefit from um, additional support. Or also sometimes not recognizing that what they're going through could be a response uh, to a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events and or as part of being in and, um, in and out of systems of care as well. The other pieces are stigma and biases, and this can be on behalf of the person, fear and concern or shame, or it can also be in terms of the providers they have contact with or the, the systems they have contact with um, and their own biases that could influence and create a challenge. The other piece is thinking about knowledge, um, where do I go if I needed something? Where do I go if I needed the help? Or where in my community can I find these supports? 
The other challenges could be um, access to health insurance, surely transportation and cost. And one of the things that I, I didn't include in here, but that I want to know is because of where we are in, um, in this virtual world, that it's not surprising that access to appropriate technology supports and reliable technologies and digital devices has, has we were aware of this and it's become more pronounced, right? That um, without access to these technologies, it can certainly create a challenge and barrier if folks are connecting over digital formats or telehealth. Another challenge can be part of the aging out process where you know, minors can be front loaded or provided an, a variety of supports. And in terms of transitioning from um, you know, uh, one type of care into the adult system, that can look differently. And also a challenge to think about is um, referrals or linkages to care. And some of the times people can need um, someone there to help navigate those systems, uh, someone there to walk them through those steps, to guide them through um, any concerns or ask them, um, respond to their questions. And thinking about how those providers themselves or the adults supporting girls and young women are also collaborating across these systems and collaborating and keeping in communication um, with providers and other organizations and agencies. Next slide. So increasing access, and I'm gonna break it down into a variety of ways. And you know, this is basically from the tenets of um, the trauma-informed care principles. Um, you know, I I apologize that we're not gonna go into detail in all these tenets, but what um, I want folks to think about is how they can modify or adjust this approach based on your role, um, based on the organization or the team that you work in, um, and based on your interactions with girls and young women in the justice system. So thinking about from the provider perspective or from the adult perspective, creating warm and non-judgmental stances or environments, um, the role of physical and emotional safety is, is extremely important. And in that, right, demonstrating showing up accountability and consistency and thinking of ways on how we're showing up to promote trustworthiness, right? Um, when we think of folks who have marginalized and been disenfranchised oftentimes, and rightfully so, there is a sense of mistrust. And so thinking about the ways in which we are showing up and um, being a consistent relationship in their lives. Promoting connection to pro-social spaces and positive relationships with peers. Um, this can be in, in groups, this can be in a community setting, um, this can look in a variety of ways. Um, but the takeaway here is thinking about the peers as, as a vehicle for healing and, um, and a community reflecting that for them. So healing happens in relationships and it happens in a meaningful sharing position of power and decision making. And so in terms of collaboration, um, recognizing that they are the active agent of planning and decision making, right? And, and that's a stance of, of, of a collaborative approach is thinking, I'm, I'm not the one going to make these decisions for them. And certainly, right, there are in the systems, there's these decisions that are made and thinking about any approach that you take, where, where does this land with the person? What are their goals? Um, ultimately, what motivates them? And getting their input and having them, you know, feel like they are in the position of power and control to decide for themselves what is healing and what recovery looks like for them and providing a space where they feel heard, validated and affirmed. And again, this is a stance of empowerment, but it's also a stance from, you know, recognizing strengths, resiliencies and skills. And, you know, when folks have a difficult time thinking about them, it's, you know, the relationship to another adult, to a mentor that in that they can, you know, find places where they can tap into those skills and also um, start to feel more empowered to make those changes and to work for their own meaning for recovery. And recognizing the historical and cultural 
uh, traumas that impact people's experiences and offering access to gender responsive and culturally affirming services. And for this, the stance is recognizing that folks of color, young women, um, girls of color, trans women, and gender nonconforming folks have experienced and continue to experience um, being marginalized and being discriminated against. So really recognizing that and thinking with the person, what would they feel most safe with and comfortable? And what do they define as places and spaces that would lend to their healing? Next slide. So in increasing access to support and services, you know, in, in touching upon healing relationships, this is piece about fostering relationships and connections. Now, you know, at any approach that we take, we want to consider for, for the person, for girls and young women, who are the folks in their network? Who are these people who they define as family members? Um, and if appropriate and if available, thinking about how are we reaching out to them to strengthen those relationships? How are we also um, building those connections with them to strengthen that support network for the young person? This can include and not limited to um, caregivers, um, parents, extended family members, chosen family, partners and children. And of course, again, we consider the appropriateness and, and if available, right? And also with the person um, who we're interacting with, what do they think about this? And, and is that okay with them as well? And thinking about members in the local community or um, peers ha who have lived experience and building those relationships across, um, relationships and connections to folks in the community. This can look like local organizations, schools, also thinking about um, the role of religious or spiritual connection if appropriate for the person. And really it's about what lands with them, who do they see as, and what do they define as community and fostering those connections. The other piece is about pro uh, provider collaboration. And that collaboration, you know, it, it, it's about thinking about it in, in different perspectives. And, you know, we, we all work in different agencies and organizations, or we have different roles where, you know, the philosophy or the mission um, or the goals can differ. And, you know, I think in, in terms of the collaboration, building those relationships across um, communities and agencies to create informal partnerships or formal partnerships, so that the person feels held, um, not just by one person or not just by one team or by one provider, but held by multiple people. And again, it's building those relationships, either formal or informal um, across settings. So we'll go to next slide. Now, again, increasing access. Um, when you know, in earlier slides, we talk about uh, barriers and challenges to access. I also want to think about access to services as not just treatment, right? Um, there are multiple levels in which we can, in our roles, we can provide information. We can um, take the stance of meeting someone where they are, depending on what they're interested in, depending on what they're defining for themselves as healing and, um, you know, what they're able to do. And so from the information level, again, one of the challenges is, is knowing where to go to for help, where to access information when needed, um, the technology piece, right? And so it's about thinking of ways to provide an increase um, uh, availability of resources, knowing where to go in their community, knowing um, where they can also go access, um, you know, material goods if needed. The other piece is about, um, you know, identifying resources with a person, uh, like I mentioned, basic needs, medical care and transportation, meeting those needs can also, um, you know, reduce any challenges in accessing supports. Again, 
um, I'm including here the technology and digital access as we know in, in during this times so that's become um, extremely important. And also access to resources, I would include in here the, the literacy skills, digital literacy skills um, to include extended family members and caregivers in that process as well, if appropriate. Um, the skills piece, and it depends on what the person defines as, as the skills that they wanna build or things that they're interested in. Um, could look like a, a parent group, a parent support group. Um, vocational training, um, job readiness skills, internships. It can look like a grease circle. It can certainly look like, um, you know, different types of spaces, uh, you know, circles for young women, for girls, or spaces where, you know, um, they feel comfortable and they want to build those relationships across. And that also includes the group piece, providing opportunities for them to create um, connections uh, in positive support circles and spaces. And of course, the, the treatment part, you know, there's various ways to, to think about treatment and different types of therapies that I didn't include here. But that's certainly one type of support and, and access. It's not the only one, but that is one that I think, um, if appropriate, and where the person is can be really supportive and beneficial to them. And this can include variety of therapies, either individual, family, or group, and connection to psychiatry for medication. And again, I wanted to list them at different levels and intervals with the idea that meeting, where, meeting the person where they are and knowing that um, healing is not linear, change is not linear, it is on a continuum. And if someone is not in a space to be ready, um, that that's okay. You know, we roll with it. Um, we provide a different resource of information to work with them. Where are they? Where are they at? And what do they define right now as the priority for themselves? We'll go to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our program uh, within UCSF, the Division of Infant, Child, and Adolescent Psychiatry, within the uh, JJBH team. We're going to go to the next slide, which is. Um, the Voices Heal Gender Responsive Programming. So I am one, uh, I am one of many uh, folks on the team um, who identify as multicultural uh, and multidisciplinary women uh, providing uh, support services to young women in San Francisco. Again, Voices Heal is one of multiple programs in San Francisco who are doing this type of work in a variety, in, in different ways and in different scopes. So I want to put that out there as well. Now, um, our aim here is, is based on the trauma-informed care principles in which we try at different levels to create those safe spaces and cultivating trust with the young person and across um, natural supports or their support network. Again, from our position, you know, knowing that we, we come with the privilege of knowing the medical and mental health system and supporting and lending to that information of navigating systems of care um, and recognizing that there are challenges and there are barriers to that access and how can we work to reduce those challenges and barriers and promote, um, promote appropriate supports for them. Collaborating again across providers and teams. So if it's within our team or building those relationships, and as I see on, on screen, I recognize multiple people. And so I think building those relationships, recognizing the, uh, the awesome work that's being done in the community and knowing, hey, we're not the only one. And um, we want to build those relationships across teams so that folks you know, who may not feel comfortable or want something different know who, who they can uh, reach out to and certainly bridging those connections for them. Creating spaces where we can foster uh, groups in a variety of ways uh, for girls and young women and providing opportunity to build on the skills that they, and resiliencies that are already there, building those coping skills. And um, in formal and informal ways, getting the opportunity to involve the perspectives of the youth and the families. Right, uh, next slide. How am I doing on time? I wanna just make sure that I'm noting. I, 
Okay. You're, you're doing perfect. Jamie. Okay. <laughs> awesome. You're Thank doing you. perfect. So who, who are we currently serving? Um, so since the inception of, of our Voices Heal program, which has been approximately maybe two and a half years, um, we've served to approximately 223 girls and young women um, within the San Francisco community. 84 um, identify as people of color, 40, about 43 or more um, have uh, live or have caregivers who are non-English speaking. And 12, approximately 20, 12% identify um, as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Go to the next slide. And so um, within our team and within our program, uh, I'm gonna just briefly touch upon the services offered. Um, but I do wanna highlight that as of last year, given everything that's gone on, we had to quickly transition into, as, as we all have in some certain capacity, telehealth or digital formatting and, and, and try to respond as quick and as appropriate as possible, given that things were changing. Um, and so, Currently, all the services that, that you see here are provided through Zoom, through email, through text message, phone calls, and a variety of ways that we can reach out um, using uh, technology to youth and families. And so um, in the girls and young women's groups, you know, we, we implement, um, you know, our gender responsive curriculum has been facilitated over Zoom and what we've also done is created, not created, adjusted and created our curriculum to address um, the reactions and the impact that the pandemic have had on girls and young women, especially in the relational aspect. And so, um, currently, we're we are um, facilitating girls groups right now called uh, Teleheal, and so it's based off of cognitive behavioral therapy principles with the goal to foster those relationships on screen with girls um, and young women. And, um, you know, again, we're modifying and adjusting um, to the response of things that are going on um, within the pandemic and also uh, modifying and adjusting based on the girls' feedback. We enlist their feedback on a weekly basis and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's live, we're making those changes as we speak. So the case management and mental health services again also provided over digital health. And I wanna say, um, you know, one of the things that I myself and, and team members and also within our division are really pushing forward is, is ways to increase technology access um, to youth and families who don't have reliable Wi-Fi, who don't have um, the resources to pay for uh, smart devices. And so thinking about um, increasing opportunities for them so that they're able to participate and not, um, not contributing to those challenges and barriers as well. And then the linkage to internal and external providers. Um, again, if our program, you know, for any reason, they don't want to participate or we don't offer something that they would be interested in. Again, we partner with various um, organizations and agencies to foster those relationships so that they can participate in something that they're interested in, want to do and ready for. Next slide. Okay, so including here some of the references, again, um, you know, the trauma-informed care principles, I went through them quickly, but I encourage folks who are not familiar with them, you know, you can go uh, to the um, SMHSA uh, website and the link is right there and certainly review them and think of, and about our role as providers and within our teams of how to make those adjustments and modifications to promote that access. Next slide and and thank you all um, again thank you for victim services unit for the invitation to share um, uh, 
currently what our program is offering and doing. And if people wanted to connect, I'm happy to connect over email, including my email address there. Happy to respond to any questions. Um, I know it's hard to cover a lot of content um, in a short amount of time and also want to make sure that there's enough time for questions and answers in Gina's presentation as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, really great information that you provided for us. I want to give everyone an opportunity if they do have any questions for Jamie that we could provide those questions in the chat and I could share that with um, our group here. And so if we don't have any questions, Jamie, and Jamie questions may come after Gina provides her presentation of course. and kind of um, um, we'll be able to to open that up at the end as well. So for now, I think what we're going to do, um, it is a two hour training. So we're going to give everyone a break. We will provide a five minute um, stretching um, break and then also a five minute um, um, meditation. And so I'll give you um, a time when to return. But we did receive a question here. Um, could you say a little bit about the age profile of the girls you work with? Oh yes, really great question. I forgot to include that in the in the slides. Um, 12 uh, to 24, so uh, young adolescents up uh, 24, because we know that Tay can include 26, 27 and 28, so 12 to 24. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. And I also, um, when we do follow up with the PowerPoints and the certificates, and other information, I will also be including Jamie's contact information. Um, so we will include that. So why don't, why don't I give a time of when we will return? Um, give me one minute. Let me just see how long our, um, our break time is gonna be. And it looks like it is going to be for 10 minutes. So why don't we return back here at, 11.08, how's that? So 11.08, we'll be back. Um, with that, Kitty, if you could share our stretching videos, that would be great. Offices, and we're going to do some desk stretches. Hi, Asata McKenzie here, and I'm here in the Chatelaine offices, and we're going to do some desk stretches. One of the best things to do to increase circulation is to just take a big reach up, inhaling, and then exhaling. Oh, a nice overhead stretch. Lean to one side. With your feet flat, you're sitting tall, and then go ahead and do that on the other side. Just sit upright on your chair so that you can actually feel feet flat. Pick up your shoulders, roll them up, back, and down, improving posture here. We're just taking our ear to opposite shoulder, still sitting tall. And then another breath, and ear goes to the other side. I'll just go sideways for this one. It's for you to drop your chin towards your throat, really round your spine, and then interlace fingers, push palms forward. So we sit again with our feet flat, just about hip distance, and we take forearms to thighs. Good. Hang out here a moment, and then slowly take hands down. You're trying to rest your ribs just around the thighs, and then drop chin to throat. Take your right arm out to the side, good. And just sort of follow your thumb as your arm comes across and rest your hand outside your leg. Hand and leg tension as you lift your chest and try to look over your shoulder. You're going to extend your front leg so your toes are up, good. Bend your both knees actually and send your bum back as if you want to sit to that chair behind you. Bend your knees a bit. Shift your weight into one leg, and then just lift your opposite leg up. You're holding onto your ankle. 
Good. Reaching one arm up to the sky. Bend knees. Inhale, lift. Exhale, sideways. See ya. Welcome to your meditation. I'm Dr. Robert Eric Dinenberg, and I'll guide you through from start to finish. Mindfulness is present moment attention without judgment. For this meditation, we'll attend to our feet with mindfulness, and then we'll move on to the breath in the abdomen. And then to finish, we'll return to the feet. So let's get started. With mindfulness, start to observe your feet. Answer this question to yourself. What does it feel like to have my feet on the ground in this present moment? Explore this present moment experience of your feet. You might notice what it feels like to have your feet in your shoes, in your socks. You might observe different points of pressure presenting to different parts of your feet. And you might notice temperature. Simply observe whatever you notice. There's no right or wrong no good or bad. Whatever you notice is okay. And anything that takes you away from this noticing is a distraction. Any thought about the future or the past, any worry or expectation, any internal dialogue or judgment, notice and let go. With forgiveness, with patience, notice and let go, notice and let go, and shepherd your attention back to your feet. And when you're ready, let go of your feet and shift your attention to your abdomen. Here we find the home base for mindfulness of breathing. Observe what it feels like to breathe in this present moment. Explore and discover your own way of noticing your own breath. You might observe a rising of your abdomen as you breathe in and a falling as you breathe out. Your own way of noticing your own breath might include registering an expanding feeling as you breathe in and a deflating feeling as you breathe out. Ride the waves of your breath with your attention. Anything that takes you away from your breath is a distraction. Any thought about the future or the past, any worry or internal dialogue, any expectation or judgment, notice and let go. Notice and let go. With forgiveness, notice and let go. And time and time again, shepherd your attention back to your breath. Back to answering this very simple question. What does it feel like to breathe in this present moment?
And when you're ready to transition out of the meditation, return to your feet. This time there can be some movement in your toes. And notice what it feels like to be moving your toes in this present moment. And let this movement transition you out of the meditation. So as your fingers are moving and if you wish your body's stretching, you can transition fully out of the meditation. Thank you. Lisa, can we test? Can you hear me? I could hear you clearly. Um, why don't okay. we? Yeah, you sound clear. Okay. I can hear you. Great. Perfect. All right. So it'll be about two more if minutes, start everyone. On, let's start on slide four when you're ready. Perfect, Gina. And I'll keep the video off just to make sure we don't have any problems. Okay. It just. Thank you guys for jumping in and quickly shifting and thank you Jamie if you're still on yes yeah, still here no problem Gina thank you so much So we're going to get started. I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, and we will begin on slide four, Dr. Gina Castro Rodriguez. Thank you so much, everyone. You know, one of the things in my private practice that I talk to young women about all the time is being able to adapt under stress and high uh, intense situations. And so I'm sitting in my car using car Wi Fi, but I'm here <laughs> and we'll be able to finish the training. So thank you all for hanging in there. And thank you so much to Jamie for uh, jumping in. Appreciate it. I'm just going to go back a little bit in case people miss things. I want to talk about ACEs first. And ACEs is this really important study that happened about 25 years ago with Kaiser and Dr. Vince Felitti and the Center for Disease Control. Dr. Felitti noticed that in his work with patients that had chronic obesity and health issues, Anecdotally, they would tell him about a lot of uh, trauma that they'd experienced as a child, bad things that had happened to them. And so he wanted to find out if there was a direct correlation and if there, people who had chronic health problems had more of these incidences in their childhood. And so what he did was he took these, um, these nine adverse experiences and he did a 10, a, a, Ten, oops, sorry, now I'm getting calls.
we'll be right with you. Um, if you enjoyed the stretches and the meditation, we've also have included those links in the chat. Um, and I will also go ahead and include that with my follow-up email. So just give us one second. I'm also going to include my email in the chat to everyone just in case uh, people have questions and want to connect afterwards over email or things come up after the presentation. So I'll put that in the chat. Thank you, Jamie, for doing that. That will be really helpful. And let me follow up be with everyone shortly. Hi, can you hear me, Lisa? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. So the important issue here for working with kids in delinquency or girls in delinquency is that the more ACEs they had in childhood, the more chronic issues they seem to have as adults. Next slide. So girls that are involved in delinquency are two times as likely to report having four or more ACEs. And four or more ACEs is sort of the highest threshold that was found in the study to have a big impact on physical, emotional, and behavioral health. And the impact that it had um, was pretty significant and, and caused si significant problems for people later in life, including early death. So it affects physical health, things like autoimmune disease, uh, heart disease, lung disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, emotionally, it, it is correlated with things like depression and anxiety, uh, suicidality, um, even self-harm. And then socially, it's correlated with things like smoking and, and drinking and, and using drugs, um, even poor relationships. And so we know that the things that happen in childhood not only have implications around the event, they also have far reaching implications for the rest of the person's lives. And that's important because one, it makes this a public health issue rather than a, 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 just a criminal activity or an incident. And also it really, helps us have an opportunity to intervene and change that trajectory for kids who've experienced these kind of traumas in their early childhood. So when we're talking about girls that enter the delinquency system, um, we're seeing a lot of emotional ramifications from their trauma. So things like anger and irritability, depression, association, eating disorders, relationship dysfunction and social phobias. Um, and one of the things that I write about a lot is the, the impact of trauma in early childhood is that girls lose the ability to keep themselves safe or to have that detector that we all have where we question things or we feel that things, something might be safe, not safe um, and then act upon it. And so they lose some of the ability to predict things that might be dangerous and then protect themselves from it. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then the second layer that we see is a lot of physical um, abuse that these young women have experienced. And that expresses itself as anger, uh, aggression, violence, uh, replication of intimate partner violence, relationships, uh, even sexual perpetration and criminal behavior. And that's really important because when someone is hurt and can't protect themselves, then they can lash out at other people in order to, to protect themselves from being hurt again or keep other people away. And then we often start naming that behavior as delinquent and punishing it 
punishing them for it rather than trying to figure out why they're angry and what has happened to them to have them react in that way. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the predictors. We know that some people are more at risk for delinquency. Um, Trauma is a primary predictor of delinqu delinquency. We know that when a child has experienced trauma, that is the number one predictor of later risk-taking and delinquent behavior. 70% of girls in the juvenile justice system report having one of those ACEs that we, dis that we discussed earlier. I'm just gonna pause for a minute for the interpreter. Thank you, Gina. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, girls are the victim of violence uh, more often in our society, and actually they're four times more likely to be abused than boys. Girls experience sexual violence at a higher rate than boys, but they also experience sexual violence earlier uh, than boys do. And some of the reactions that come from sexual violence are aggression, substance abuse to numb the pain of the trauma, self-harm, which is a coping mechanism for dealing with trauma that you've experienced, risky sexual behavior, depression, anxiety, self-destructive behavior, low self-esteem, suicidality, and survival behaviors, which we'll also talk about. There's a reference section of this presentation where you'll see all the research um, with with the statistics cited. So if you're interested in this topic, you can do more research on it. Um, all of the, it will all be in the reference section. Slide. So what does this mean for an adolescent, for a young woman going through, uh, who has had abuse in their childhood and is now going through adolescence? What we see is that that early childhood trauma puts them at additional risk for violent behavior for potential criminal or delinquent behavior, and unfortunately for re-victimization. So what we know about this pipeline is that it starts with abuse, um, whether that's in the home or outside of the home, and then it moves to this risk-taking, uh, which is part of the normal developmental cycle for an adolescent. A normal adolescent between the ages of 12 and 14 is beginning to develop their own sense of who they are. They're beginning to explore the world more. They're beginning to take on more um, responsibility and have more freedom. And they're trying to figure out where they fit in in the world. And that requires risk. And every child has a different sense of urgency for their risk or tolerance for their risk. And they're going to use that to guide how they negotiate the world. What we know about kids that have experienced trauma is that they take more risk. Uh, they tend to be in more dangerous situations. And some of that has to do with that doling of that sense of danger and the sense of being able to protect themselves. So they're engaging in a normal part of their adolescent development, but for kids who've experienced trauma, this is a little bit more risky. And eventually, if we don't intervene and we don't provide support and we don't have good resources for young people, what we see is our, our two outcomes. We see either young people that continue to persist with delinquent and then criminal behavior, or we see young people that um, become victims and, and experience continued victimization. So we call those poly victims. So those are victims that their initial trauma happened in childhood, and then they continue to experience other victimizations across the lifespan. And that tra trauma becomes layered, harder to negotiate, harder to manage, harder to treat, and harder for them to live with. Next slide. There's a particularly important kind of trauma, uh, which is complex trauma, uh, because it adds a layer of betrayal. So complex trauma is when a child is harmed by someone who is supposed to take care of and love them. So that could be their parents, could be their caregivers, it could be someone who's in a caregiving position, like a teacher or a coach or a pastor, um, you know, a, a sibling, a, 
a, a neighbor, someone who was supposed to be a healthy, protective adult, but instead became someone that either hurt them or didn't protect them from harm. And I want to talk a little bit about not protecting from harm, because this is something that girls experience at a different rate than boys do. Um, sometimes we have caregivers who have their own issues, whether you know it's substance abuse or mental health or, or physical illness or um, you know, it could be it could be anything that's impairing their parenting function. And when they have those issues, they don't have the ability to, to protect their children in the same way as if they didn't have those issues. And what happens is sometimes children get hurt because they're not they're not given the proper supervision, or they're exposed to people who hurt them, or they're left with people who don't care about them and who hurt them, um, or people are brought into their home that are dangerous. And I have heard countless stories by young women where, you know, maybe mom's boyfriend hurt them uh, and sexually abused them, or maybe they, they spent a lot of time at home and there were people in and out of their house and someone sexually assaulted them or somebody abused them. So it's not just the fact that the parent caused the physical harm or the emotional harm or the sexual harm, but that the parent wasn't able to prevent that can cause this complex trauma too. So the implications of complex trauma are one, the inability to form and maintain healthy relationships because that framework of what a healthy relationship is has been skewed because the person that was supposed to love and take care of them didn't do that. And so they, they have a skewed sense of what safety is and what a healthy relationship is and what protection is. It also leads to erratic difficult interpersonal styles. So it can feed the basis of character challenges or things like uh, personality disorders, which, which are really just people's real life experience and then the reaction to that. So things like being angry and pushing people away because you're worried that other people have the potential to harm you or attaching to someone and trying to make that relationship work even when it's not working because you're afraid to be alone or um, never be, being able to be intimate and vulnerable with someone because when you were vulnerable as a child, bad things happened to you. So it can frame the way your interpersonal style develops and how you relate to people in the future. That of course leads to low fidelity in relationships. So relationships that have a lot of challenges and problems and be, can be chaotic and often include a lot of abuse, emotional abuse, emotional neglect, uh, physical abuse, and even sexual abuse. So the really important thing there is that this young person who experienced trauma as a child and couldn't defend themselves is now recreating those situations in their relationships that they're choosing because one, the, you know, they have a skewed sense of what a healthy relationship is. They are partnering with people who've experienced similar things to themselves. They have more comfort or tolerance for some of the harder things in a relationship that someone who didn't experience that might have. And then also they stay in those relationships longer because their self-esteem or their sense of self has been affected so that they're they are not sure that they deserve to be safe or deserve to be uh, in a different kind of relationship. So it causes a whole pattern of relationship issues. And finally, you know, when you witness and experience violence, either in your relationship with your caregivers or par parents, or you witness it between your caregivers and parents, what that builds for a child is a sense of capacity for love to also include aggression and violence in it. So we build our concept of love when we're children by watching, by, uh, you know, experiencing, by, um, having it modeled for us, and we integrate that into what we think love is. And then we'll test that over and over again as we get older in our own relationships. But when we start with a foundation that love also includes violence and also includes pain, then that becomes part of our own integrated experience in our relationships when we grow up. Next slide. I'm gonna to touch just briefly on brain development and what is happening at this time for adolescents. Um, 
and, and for girls and young women, you know, our brain develops uh, from the moment we're born. We have 100 billion neurons in our head, all filled in our gray matter. And as soon as we start taking a breath and making a movement, neurons start to connect. So brain development uh, or learning is really just experience. It's what we do in our brain making a connection about what, what has happened or what we've experienced and then learning that and holding that information. So for adolescents, uh, they're at about mid-brain development, which means that you know the, the base of their brain is developed and the base of their brain is, is all the automatic functions that we have, the ability to breathe, the ability for our organs to work, the ability for us to digest food, eliminate food, those kinds of things. That's all there. All that capacity is there when we're born. And then the rest of the brain starts to develop. So the middle of the brain, uh, is the limbic system. That's the emotional center of our brain. And that's really where they're at maximum development in adolescence, that, that emotional center of our brain. So everything an adolescent does, thinks, um, you know, interprets, goes through that emotional filter. They're, they're experiencing it and they're feeling it. That's normal in their development. Um, but what the challenge is that that just normal developmental stage uh, contributes to is, you know, it's it's you're feeling things and you're expressing them right away. I'm sure you all have had that experience with teenagers that they kind of just say whatever they feel. Um, they feel it and they act on it. Now, as they grow up or as they mature, the front part of our brain will start to develop. And that front part of the brain is really more the executive function of the brain. And that part of the brain will speak to the emotional part of the brain and start to learn to regulate it. So you feel something, but you will the front part of your brain will start to check that feeling and decide if it's appropriate to say something, if it's appropriate to do something, if it's in your best interest to act on it. So at Adolescence and, and young adulthood, that part, those two parts of the brain are not working integrated and effectively together yet. They're, uh, they can even work separately from each other. So what we see is adolescents in general uh, have less control of their impulses, um, have less ability to foresee what the consequences of something that they're doing uh, are. They have less ability to temper their emotions and their reactions. They're overvaluing that reward system part of their brain, which is telling them it feels good, so just do it and don't think about the consequences. And then they undervalue the risk of something. I think you could all think back to a time when you were 12 or 13 and you did something that you now would not do because you're an adult now. And if you think about it, it might've been dangerous or it might've been too risky or it might've been you know, too hard on your body or it might've, you know, the, the outcome might have not have been worth it. But when you're an adolescent, you just don't have the capacity to quickly make those decisions. It, it's why when you're an adolescent, you take more chances than you'll take at any other time in your life. And there's a positive piece to this. You know, when we take risk, when we try things, when we don't think about what the outcome is, we can be extremely creative. We can uh, develop and, and um, create things that we won't be able to do at any other time in our lives. You know, musicians, writers, um, artists, um, you know, people that create technology. All of this stuff started in this late adolescence, early young adulthood stage because they were they had the capacity to take those chances. So it's a great time, but it does pose some risk. Now, the middle of the brain, that, um, that amygdala, that's the emotional center of the brain, is hyperactivated. And so they're taking in information from their senses. They're having feelings, and then those feelings get expressed really strongly. This is why we fall in love during this time. This is why we think that we are, you know, the person that we're in love with. We're never going to feel like this again. We, we're, we can't live without them. We can't be without them. It's the most important relationship in our lives. It's because our amygdala is overactive and it's really connecting and making those connections at this age. Now, 
that's a good thing because it feels good and it's it's part of helping that young person develop their emotional framework for relationships in the future but it's also risky why because they will take chances and risks for that relationship that they wouldn't take later in life so doing dangerous things uh taking chances that they wouldn't take doing things for other people this is all motivated by that emotional connection and then the last one is the hippocampus and the hippocampus is midbrain and the hippocampus helps us to manage stress and it's one of the uh, mechanisms in our HPA axis, which is our um, our axis that m activates our fight, flight, or response. Um, and the hippocampus, when somebody has is in mid development and in adolescent development, you know, the hippocampus is learning to manage stress and to help the person take in those emotions, feel them, and then regulate them. Um, when the hippocampus is not working correctly because of trauma that has happened in the past or because of stress that's happening in the present, the hippocampus is not able to manage the stress and people get overwhelmed, get emotionally dysregulated. Um, they can also have trouble forming memories because the hippocampus is related to taking in information around the memory and helping store it in long-term memory. And it also affects their ability to cope with the stress. So the ability to tolerate something that's really stressful and has happened without just throwing things away. I've worked with young people for a really long time, for, for the past 30 years. It's, you know, adolescents and young adults are my favorite population to work with. There's so much capacity there. There's so much opportunity there. Um, and there's some of the smartest, most creative, daring people I've ever met. But the, the challenge is harnessing all of those emotions, all of those uh, expressions of their feelings, and then helping them do it in a way that keeps them safe and keeps them uh, on the road to future thinking and being able to have a future that includes safety and protection. So it's, it's really a challenging time, but it's also a great opportunity. And I like to emphasize both of those because, you know, we get messages that, about teenagers, you know, no one wants to work with them. I've had I've had people tell me I'll work with, you know, 20 adults versus one teenager. Um, we've sort of vilified this age when really it's a beautiful age. It's just young people need supports around them in order to be safe and develop themselves and, and have these opportunities. Okay, next slide. Okay, now I want to talk about a protective reaction to trauma for girls. This is really important. When a child, a, a young girl has experienced trauma, trauma teaches you lessons. Trauma is like touching the flame and learning not to touch the fire again, right? So when you've experienced trauma, you've, your future is framed around that experience with trauma. And the expressions of that can be anger, you know, you're really angry that someone hurt you, someone didn't protect you, that this thing that shouldn't have happened to you happened to you. And you can express that as anger. It can be aggression where the child internalizes, I'm going to hurt other people before they hurt me. I'm going to protect myself in that way. It can be confrontational. I'm not even going to allow people to get close enough to me to hurt me again. So I'm going to become this person that is, you know, angry and resentful and lashes out, that way I protect myself from people hurting me. It can look like defiance. I'm not gonna do anything that you tell me to do. Even though this is a normal part of adolescent de development, this gets magnified by young women who've experienced trauma in their childhood because they, they're working from a place of survival. I need to make sure this doesn't happen to me again. And then sometimes, it affects their ability to stave off future victimization. So I think of our amygdala in our brain as kind of like a, a danger detector. Our amygdala is always scanning the environment, the senses out in our environment, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we feel. And it takes that information in and it decides, are we okay or are we in danger? 
So when you're a child and that system is still developing and something terrible happens to you, two things can happen in your future. Either that system can get hyper reactive. So you're afraid of everything. You're afraid that everything could potentially hurt you. And you're either going to be scared and have anxious reactions, or you can have those aggressive reactions that we've been talking about that, you know, you're going to push people away before they have the capacity to hurt you. But the other thing that happens, and I've seen this with a lot of young women that I've worked with, is that that danger detector starts to malfunction and not work very well. And because people that were supposed to take care of you and protect you actually were the ones that hurt you or didn't protect you, that danger detector starts to dull and isn't able to read those signals very well. So I'll give you an example of what this looks like when I'm working with a young adult woman. I'm working with a young adult woman and she's talking to me about, oh, we're gonna stop for a moment for the interpreter, sorry. So because women and girls are relational, this often shows up in their relationships. And I will be working with a young adult woman and we're, we'll be talking about a relationship that, that didn't work well and someone hurt them. And then we're, you know, they're getting out of that relationship and they're talking about the next relationship. And the next person they meet, they've got lots of great things to say about this person. Um, you know, he or she is like this and they're wonderful and, um, Here's all the things that I like about them. And I am starting to hear some red flags, some things that make me worry about this person they're talking about. Maybe it's about their history. Maybe it's about the way that they're treating my client. Maybe it's about um, the information that they're not giving my client or the unknowns. And so I'll ask my client, do you, does that sound right to you? Does that sound safe to you? Oh, yeah, that's fine, because they're a really great person. And, you know, they're amazing. And, and I love them. Okay, so then I'll do something that I call lending them my mind, where I actually share what my concerns might be, right? They, they haven't, they don't have that activation that I have. So I might lend it to them. And I might say something like, I hear that sounds like, you know, you're really connected to this person, you have a lot of fun with them. I feel a little concerned that you don't know where they live or that they only can call you, but you can't call them. Does that worry you? So I'll start giving some examples to them of things that are raising my danger sensor, but not raising theirs. And we start talking about red flags and what they are and what purpose they serve and how they can protect us. And you know, the best feedback I get is, after we've done this for a while discussing relationships that I'll have a young woman say, you know, I heard this from them and I thought that's a red flag. That's a red flag for me that, that they don't want to share that in information or that they don't want me to meet this person or that they're telling me that I can't do things and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take action to protect myself. So that's really healthy. It's not pushing everyone away, but it's not letting everyone in. The other example I see is when I work with a young woman who, before they know who I am, will start telling me every horrible thing that's happened to them and sharing really personal, vulnerable information. That's a problem because that young woman's boundaries have been broken and that young woman doesn't know how to protect herself from people, uh, including me, because she doesn't know me yet. And she doesn't know if I'm trustworthy yet. And she doesn't know if I deserve to have her private vulnerable information yet. And so with that client, I'll be working on protecting herself and not having to share that information with everyone and, and to hold that information for people who deserve her to share that information with them, who will hold it and protect it for her. And so I like the girl that shows up angry and pushes everyone away and doesn't want to participate in group at first or sits in therapy and doesn't want to talk to me because that girl at least is protecting herself and we're going to try to help her open up when people deserve to be opened up so i don't go in expecting that someone's going to work with me or expecting that someone's going to respect me or trust me i have to go in and earn that respect and trust by showing up 
by being accountable, by being a healthy adult, by listening and caring. Those are the things that I have to prove to this person because I want them to go out in the world and find people who deserve to, to accept their, their experience and, and, and to be vulnerable in front of. So it's a really important lesson in the work that we do, whatever you do with young people. Next slide. Okay, so trauma, remember I said teaches lessons. It teaches us lessons about ourselves, about others and about the world. What it teaches us about ourselves is this sense of, can we be safe? Can we trust? And what is our value? When we're kept safe, we, and, and bad things haven't happened to us or, or they've happened, but we've been protected, then we can walk around knowing that the world is gonna be mostly safe and that we will be mostly safe. So we'll take moderate risk. We will, we will take care of ourselves when things don't look right or sound right or feel right. We will push back when somebody's doing something to us that, that is not in our best interest. Um, our sense of other is affected. You know, whether or not we think other people will harm us, whether or not we think other people um, can love us, whether or not we think um, you know, it's risky when we engage with people, if it's risky or not risky. So it, it guides how we see other people in the world when things have happened to us. If the good things have happened to us, then we think that other people have potential to be good to us. But when bad things like trauma have happened to us, then we think that other people have the capacity to hurt us and we change our behavior based on that. And then ultimately, it also frames our sense of the world. Is the world safe? Is it fair? Is it, um, you know, is it going to mostly take care of us so that we can have forward thinking and think about what we're going to do next year and in five years and in 10 years and in 20 years? When we've experienced trauma, our world has been unsafe. And when you're a child, your world is very small. So if you experience the world as an unsafe place, you're going to feel like it's not just unsafe, but it's unfair. And if the world is unsafe and unfair, then that's really going to guide how we walk around in the world. If I think I live or I'm, I'm in a, a really dangerous place, the way I behave is very different than I'm, if I'm in a safe and protected space. Um, who I am, how I walk around, how I engage with other people, what I think about, all of those things are framed by my sense of safety and well-being. And for kids who've experienced trauma, some of that has already been set in place. And that's what treatment about is about, is about expanding that sense of safety and that sense of danger and fairness in the world. Next slide. So let's talk about criminal or delinquent behaviors. So for girls, we see, um, oh, am I on the wrong side? No, I am, okay. For girls, what I see is um, they've witnessed violence in relationships around them, whether that's their caregivers or people in their household, their siblings, relatives. And remember that frames the way that they uh, are integrating violence and love. Um, in the criminal justice system, we see a lot of kids that are arrested for domestic violence. So they're replicating that violence in their own home, either violence with siblings or violence with their parents. And so we see arrests for that. We still see a lot of status offense rest, uh, uh, arrests. And those are things that are only illegal because of their age. So things like running away, uh, truancy and substance abuse. And these are directly related to trauma. Uh, many times girls run away because things are not safe or healthy in their household. So they run away to find more safety, but then remember those danger detectors are, have been dulled and damaged. And so they don't always connect with really healthy people who then help them be safe. They connect with other unhealthy people. And I gotta tell you that when you're 14 years old and you're a runaway, there's not a bunch of healthy adults out there waiting to pick you up. There's a lot of unhealthy adults that take in 14 year olds, right? And that use them and that give them some sense of safety and love enough to keep them connected and bonded with them, but are using them for either their, you know, their physical body, their emotional connection, sometimes their, 
even just their resources, like taking care of kids or cleaning house or, or being there with them, uh, carrying weapons for them, you know, helping them do illegal behaviors, all of those things end up being the compensation that the young person has to pay to an adult to take care of them when they're not their family. Truancy is another example of, you know, they wouldn't be arrested for truancy if they weren't a child, but sometimes school is not safe. We talked about that repeat victimization. And so sometimes kids who've experienced trauma in their home also experience trauma in schools and with peers. And they're staying away from school because it's not a safe place for them and because no one's protecting them there. So they basically run away from school also because it's not providing them the safety and the structure that they need. And then substance use is you know, often initially a, a, a way to, um, to calm the trauma and the feelings that they're having. And then it can become an addiction for some, but I've seen a lot of young women that are using substances just to manage sleeping or um, you know, uh, disconnecting from their, from their traumatic reactions like flashbacks or re-experiencing. And then that becomes their coping mechanism for dealing with those trauma reactions. We also see a lot of survival crimes because when your home is not safe and you're either not there at all or you're or only there occasionally, you need you still need to eat, you still need to have clothes, you still need money. So things like theft or selling or using drugs, um, joining gangs for protection, companionship, love, support, uh, money. Those things are all they make these young women more vulnerable to those things. And then the last one that's really important is human trafficking, prostitution, or exploitation. Um, I think of all children engaged in this as exploited. They don't have the power to, to, to be in the, a relationship that they're being exploited in. So I think of it as exploitation. There's a high correlation of sexual abuse with girls that are involved in exploitation, very high. Uh, most research says 90%. Um, and there's an over-representation of girls of color. Uh, somewhere between 70 and 90% of girls involved in exploitation are girls of color. So huge risk factors for girls who've experienced trauma and particularly for girls who are in the foster care system. Uh, there's a high correlation and there's some work that we're doing in San Francisco to try to identify girls very young between the ages of eight and 11 who have histories of trauma, particularly sexual abuse, and then have histories of unstable housing. So that maybe they've been moved by their caregivers. Maybe they've lived with different people um, um, you know, that are related to them in the foster care system, and now they're in foster homes and getting moved around. All of that is really bad for those young women because they need to build a sense of safety. And safety means consistency, healthy adults, having structure, having the things that you need as you develop. And that movement and that change and transition constantly happening, whether it's with your therapist or with your social worker or with your case manager or with your friends and your peers, that kind of movement is really feeds um, the, the future victimization and even crossover into delinquency for young girls. Next slide. So what is the, the delinquency system's response? So, you know, there's a, there's a big impact on public safety, but girls actually pose a really low risk to, to public safety. They typically don't do things that are violent and harmful randomly to other people. What happens is they do things for, with, or because of other people. And that's because of their relational nature, right? So I've never worked with a girl and I've worked with thousands of girls and young women in the, in the delinquency and criminal justice system that did not commit their crime that, unless it was with, for, or because of someone else. So they're not the random violent person that just walks up and hurts someone. They're doing it for something. There's a reason behind it. And it's often tied to survival for them in some way, survival in their relationship, survival in their own life. Um, it's, there's some mechanism behind it. So they have high need, but low public safety risk. Girls are also over-criminalized. We criminalize their behavior often as a way to protect them. I've been in many courtrooms where the judge says, I'm going to keep you detained for your own protection. Detention is not treatment. Detention is not a home. Detention is not safe. And so when we use detention as a way to protect girls, not only are we not protecting them, we're teaching them that 
that they can't get safety on their own and they can't figure that out. They're not gonna be able to negotiate that for themselves. We have girls that have uh, a lot of status and low level offenses, nonviolent offenses, that protectionist rationale, we're gonna protect girls, particularly uh, infuriating is protecting them from sexual activity. You know, um, if, if a girl has been exploited or a girl was caught for solicitation, we're going to keep them incarcerated so that they don't do that anymore. That's not getting to the heart of why they're out there, why they're being re-victimized, what's happening for them. Um, we also do net widening. So we if we arrest a girl and we charge them and we incarcerate them, and then that girl is now in the system, now normal things that that girl might do to protect herself in survival mode, like run away from a dangerous home or not go to school if she's being treated badly or run towards an abuser because that abuser is at least showing some love and affection, then now that young woman is gonna go deeper into the system. They're gonna be removed from their home. They're gonna have you know, longer sentences. They're gonna have longer um, probation periods. And, and those things are not getting to the heart of why they engage with the system in the first place. And then the last one is just chronic involvement in delinquency until they finally age out. You know, I used to call this corkscrewing for girls. It's that their crimes would stay around the same level, these low level nonviolent offenses, but they just chronically stayed there until the, the delinquency system had no other options for them and then would just let them go. So it'd be really common for me to work with a girl that might come in with an initial charge of shoplifting and then she would get on probation and then she might violate probation by not going to school and then she might get sent to a group home and then she might run away from that group home because it didn't feel safe to her. Um, remember this relational trauma feeds those negative relationships. And so you put six girls that all have relational trauma and histories of, of abuse into a, into a home and have them try to get along. And there's a lot of relational conflict there. So the girl runs away from the group home and then now we're gonna send her even further away. Maybe she gets sent to Colorado or she gets sent to New Mexico because she's failing the group homes, right? And so now we've widened this net of what's happening to the young person and we have them you know, chronically involved in the justice system because now we're several years in and we've tried multiple strategies. The reality is we run out of strategies and eventually if that girl stays in long enough, we'll just send her back home because we don't have any other options for her. So now what have we taught her? Just continue risky behavior and doing things that hurt you and eventually we'll let you go back home. It's a really horrible message and we haven't kept that young woman safe throughout this entire process. Next slide. I want to talk about the intersection of race, ethnicity, class, gender, and sexual identity. And I don't want to... Um, make it seem like I'm taking this piece of the work lightly at all. Uh, we're just running out of time, but it's really important that we know that girls of color are overrepresented in the delinquency system, grossly overrepresented. Particularly in San Francisco, we have a gross overrepresentation of African-American girls, and we have an overrepresentation of Latina girls. In other parts of the country, Native American girls are also overrepresented. Why that's really important is because we have to look at the factors of why do we have more African-American and Latina girls in custody? Does it have to do with over-policing in their schools, in their neighborhoods? Does it have to do with the, um, the perception that girls of color are more dangerous or more violent, uh, commit more crime? Does it have to do with the reaction from law enforcement or prosecutors or, or probation about their behavior and their willingness to comply. The, those, all of those subjective factors feed into how we criminalize children. And we really need to be thinking about how important it is to look at that individual young person and find out what happened and how did they get here. We have high rates of expulsions, truancy, referrals to alternative schools for girls of color. And we have higher perception of anger and aggression in girls of color. They're seen as more dangerous. I worked in the Department of Juvenile Justice facility in Ventura for four years with girls that were incarcerated long-term at, at that facility, which was, um, it was girls only, and it was the, the juvenile youth prison. 
My caseload was almost exclusively African American girls. Occasionally, I would have uh, an Asian American girl or a, a Latina girl, but mostly African American. Every time those girls had any kind of conflict, whether it was because of a relationship or it was with staff or you know it was between different groups in, in the facility, those girls would be seen as overly aggressive and even unfortunately given medication to calm them down or to stop their violence. And so because they were perceived as more aggressive, they were treated as more aggressive and their sentences were harsher, their consequences were harsher, even the outcomes were harsher for them. And that's all perception by people who think that, that you know, these kids are somehow more dangerous. I remember going to the facility, we would go once a month, we'd fly and then drive in because there's, no, um, there's no airports by Ventura and this would be a whole day, a, a 15 hour day that we would do. And I remember a guard telling me, looking at the list of girls that I was asking for from the Bay Area, and these were girls that were in any of the, of the five Bay Area counties we were working with. And he said, these are the worst girls we have. Why would you wanna see them? I wanna see them because you just called them the worst girls that they have. So how could you treat children that way? How could you see them that way? I see them as children who were harmed, who were let down by adults, who were not kept safe, who are acting out to, to survive, to pre preserve themselves. And you see them as monsters and I see them as children. That's why I wanna see these kids. That's the important work that you all do when you work with young women is to show them that you do see them, that you see that little girl that got hurt and no one protected and you don't see what other people see as, as this, this monster that, that now has done bad things. Next slide. We're pausing for the interpreter. Okay, the last uh, big chunk that I wanna talk about is LGBTQ youth in the delinquency system. Um, the important points here are that LGB girls are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. In a, a couple of national studies that you'll see in my references, as much as 40% of girls in custody identify as LBG. 85% um, of those youth are youth of color. Once they're in the system, they're treated very poorly out of ignorance, out of um, bad training, out of stigma, out of, you know, poor perceptions. I wrote an article years ago for the Davis Law Review that came from the perspective of the young women I was working with and chronicled some of the abuses that they were facing in long-term detention. Things like being told they were going to hell, uh, being told that if they just found a man, their problems would be over, uh, you know, trying to break up relationships that they had. Kids that are incarcerated, kids, kids anywhere, are trying to connect, trying to have relationship, trying to be close to other people. So of course that happens in detention. I remember being told by one of the wardens at the Ventura facility, these girls are kissing each other. Can you do something about that? These are teenagers who are locked up trying to have relationship and closeness with someone. That's a normal behavior. Why would you try to control that and stop that? I mean, I understand that you're in a facility, but these are also children. <laughs> these are children trying to connect, right? So our expectation of what to do with, with young people, especially when they're LGBTQ, it is skewed, it's ill-informed, it's outdated, and it doesn't understand what is happening for these young people. Next slide. So let's briefly talk about some of the in additional risks for LGBTQ youth. Um, they're twice as likely than other youth to have experienced um, trauma, especially non-conforming, not gender non-conforming youth. Um, they're more likely to experience conflict in their family, sexual abuse, child abuse, homelessness, and to have longer stays in detention when they come in connection with the delinquency system. 26% of them, report having to leave or being pushed out of their own home. 
and they're overrepresented in homeless youth. They have inadequate safety nets. So services that are out there are not geared or prepared or uh, framed for LGBTQ youth. So they're not safe for them. They, they don't provide the kinds of resources that they need. These young people are overrepresented in foster care. Um, they're, they're overrepresented in out of home placement. And then the services can be unsafe or non-responsive. And you know, even um, validating stigma uh, the institutional prejudice and discrimination. I've heard a lot of young people talking about how they don't want to engage with law enforcement because they get made fun of or they're not taken seriously or or they're, you know, especially if there's intimate partner violence, that that's not seen as intimate partner violence. It's seen as just violence between two people and it's not taking into account the relational dynamic of that. Um, and this group, like, no other is often blamed for their own victimization. Well, if you hadn't run away, or if you weren't out there, or if you didn't dress like that, or if you didn't, if you didn't identify this way, we don't do that to any other child. And here we do this to this group of children who've been hurt because of, they are, because of who they are, because of their, their identity, because of what makes them them. Um, there's a lack of services, particularly services and trainings for providers out there, for foster care parents, for service providers, for health and mental health professionals. And unfortunately, these young people have more exposure to law enforcement. Um, they get stopped more, they get arrested more, they get convicted more, um, maybe because they're out of the house more, because the house is more chaotic, maybe because of the, they have to protect themselves from people who are um, abusing them or harming them or harassing them or bullying them. They have higher rates of detainment for survival things like running away, truancy, technical violations and exploitation. And their behaviors are more scrutinized because they stand out more sometimes. Um, they have more assaults and threats in detention because detention is not a safe place for them. Next slide. I know we have two minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of run through the, the theory piece quickly. You know, I subscribe to a pathway theory, that there is a path to victimization, there is a path to criminal behavior. And the reason I like the pathway theory is that it gives us the opportunity to do something to, to um, stop that path, to intervene, to, to make changes. But it's all about you know this risk-taking behavior, survival behaviors that young people have to engage in, the systemic racism and bias of our uh, delinquency and criminal justice system the overuse of out-of-home placement for youth, the punitive school policies that have been instituted that are feeding this school to prison pipeline, uh, over system involvement in, in young people's lives. And then this, this um, reaction about when people don't conform to our sexual or gender norms that you know we see them as more aggressive or defiant, dangerous or threatening, and, and that leads to over-incarceration. Next slide. So in the last minute <laughs> of this presentation, I just wanna talk about what we can do to help young people do better, feel better, have better lives. One is invest in a nurturing home environment, providing the resources that families need to have safe homes for their children. That means safe housing, that means health care, that means enough money to live and feed their families. It means enough money to have supervision for their kids. It, it's really important to have stability and safety for kids. Kids that are stable and kept safe do better. We need early treatment and intervention, mental health and behavioral, things like Jamie talked about with the work that they're doing at UCSF. We need gender responsive services, services that respond to people's identities and really look at where those traumas come from, the relational trauma, the safety, the impact on, on their long-term relationships. We need to have support after the juvenile justice system involvement. You know, there's a lot of research that says that girls age out of delinquent behavior faster than boys age out of delinquent behavior and less of them cross over into the criminal justice system, but they still need support. Because if they're not, if they're not going to engage in delinquent behavior or criminal behavior, they're at risk for being victims themselves. And so they need that support through that young adult transition. They need healthy relationships with healthy adults. So all of you <clears throat> need to model and be that healthy, accountable adult who doesn't 
isn't going to hurt them or use them for something. And then they need opportunities for growth, success, independence, and empowerment in every activity they engage in. That's it for me. There's a long list of references in the next slide and my contact information at the end. Um, I'm sorry that we had so many technical difficulties and ran out of time for questions, but I will stay on if people have questions. And Lisa, if you wouldn't mind staying on for 10 minutes and of course. feeding me some questions, I'd appreciate it. Of course, we are do there have any a questions in the queue now. There are there are a few. Um, OK, and why don't we go right to it? Um, I have a question. Okay. Do you know of any indicators for when childhood trauma leads to this type of vulnerability and when it doesn't? because there is a percentage of people with ACE that do not fall into this category of vulnerability? Yes, that's a great question. So when the trauma is addressed and the young person is believed, the young person is helped, and the family or the caregivers around them provide them the support to recover, people can, can get past trauma, even in childhood. It's when children are not believed, when they're, they're not protected and the abuse stops, and when they don't get the right services, treatment, and supports they need to prevent this from continuing happening that we see the trajectory that I've talked about today. So we can't protect our kids from every bad thing in the world, no matter how much we try. The important thing is how we respond to it. And if parents are not able to do it, it's important that service providers um, and caregivers around them step in to do that. Thank you, Gina. We have another question. As someone who works directly with ident identifying girls in the juvenile system, everything that you have mentioned is exactly what they get criminalized throughout their adolescent years and into, just one second, and into their adult life. How do you instill all this information and implement it into historically punitive institutions such as law enforcement, probation, and the district attorney's office? We have to start changing it. We have to start looking at the why before we look at the what they did. Um, when I started working with the Girls Justice Initiative in 2003 and created an intake to, to do with, we, we ended up doing it with 2,000 girls to understand what was happening in their lives before they engaged with the, the delinquency system. Um, we spent an hour with them talking about what their home was like, what school was like, what, what kinds of things they'd experienced, what kinds of things were hard for them and getting in the way. And we were questioned about what, what does that matter? Why do we care about that? We need to focus on the behavior that they're exhibiting now. Because if we don't know what the, what's feeding that behavior, what's feeding that delinquent activity, what's feeding that non-normative behavior, then we, we can't address it and change it, right? It's not, it's not normal for a 14 year old girl to do something and be incarcerated and have to wear someone else's clothing and underwear. That's not a pleasant experience. That's not a healthy experience. So you can imagine what, the, what has happened to them to put them in that position that that's even an option to be happening right now. And if we're not asking those questions and figuring out where we failed as adults, then we're never gonna change the system. So that's where we have to start is what has happened to these young people and how do we help them get to where they should have been, which is safe and protected and uh, you know, kept safe so they can thrive. Thank you, Gina. I, um, I have Jackson who has his hand raised. Um, I've asked him to submit um, the question into the chat, but if not, I, the other, comments throughout the chat is thank you very much Gina excellent presentation thank you Jamie um, so just wanted to share those um, comments with the both of our speakers but please thank you and I really want to thank Jamie for jumping in thank you so much not thank a problem you. and thank you everyone uh, 
for one for the invitation and allowing a space to exchange uh, such critical information and for people's feedback. And again, I'll put my contact information in the chat again. Should folks have any questions and want to connect offline, I'm happy uh, to respond. So I'll put that in there. I'm sorry, I'll have to hop off um, to another meeting. Oh. Um,